Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction, uh, beloved brother, Ustad Osama. Um, it is an honor to be on the program and uh, covering um, such a critical topic at this uh, moment in time with you all. And we want to thank you all for uh, taking the time to be a part of this, uh, this uh, program. And we also uh, want to encourage you to keep on uh, supporting this particular series as it relates to uh, the different Muslim communities, because that'll help us uh, as a group um, grow in better understanding, and it'll also help our unity. And, and uh want to just let you, our audience, know your, your efforts help the Dawah effort. The Dawah effort, when we talk about that, meaning just helping people understand a practical way of looking at how this religion looks in the life of the people, beyond just the, the rituals, beyond just the books. So just wanted to encourage you and thank you all and applaud you all for your efforts and let you know that we, we look forward to your continual support and just let you know how important you are. So I wanted to uh, cover the, the the subject of Imam Warathadi Muhammad in the Austin Dawah Center. Uh, a few things that I want to just mention up front. Uh, this is the just the covering Imam Muhammad is an exhaustive topic. Um, and so I wanted to try to hit some highlights today. Um, and 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 we're just assuming, just assuming that you don't know anything about Imam Muhammad or anything about Austin Dawah Center. So we're starting there, um, and we'll kind of begin there. But hopefully, um, I would like to also be able to present more details and information about both Austin Dawah Center and the life and the legacy and impact of Imam Walter Dean Muhammad. So we look forward to doing this in more depth and then having some slides and and expanding our Q&A as well. So I'll start with some, some basics here. So one, so Imam Muhammad Rahimullahu Alayhi was born uh, on October, October the 30th, uh, 1933. Now, officially, um, uh, the city that he was born in was called Hamtrak, Michigan. That's important. So, you know, outside of Detroit, because people say Detroit, but really the, the official city was um, Hamtrak, Michigan. Just trying to get you some some dates there in 1933. And so I want to talk about the what affected him uh, in his life and so that we can see that in his leadership, because that's also us in this context, especially for us in the West. Right. And some of us have a broader exposure to Islam, meaning that we have family members outside of the West or and we, or we traveled outside of the West, right? Or we were born outside of the West, right? And I'm just talking about now in the context of this particular uh, story today, the, the just setting the backdrop that you're talking about, this is the 30s, so this is uh, the Depression era, okay? And you're talking about a group of people who in our history tells us that uh, were brought over here as slaves, right? And their identity and their religious identity and their culture and their history, all these things were taken away from them. So we're, we're talking about a people transitioning and looking to discover themselves. And as it relates to Islam, we're talking about a people at this point in time who had lost their Islam, right? And not even aware of their connection with Islam. So We'll start here. So in this particular time, so uh, his father, Elijah Muhammad, uh, became the leader of what was at that time called the Nation of Islam. And so I want to say some things so we can understand. So this 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 new it was called Islam. Right. But. Some of the teachings were not Islamic principles or Islamic ideas. They had Islamic terminology. Um, like uh, Allah, Muhammad, right? Assalamu alaikum. But in terms of how they were applying the religion of Islam, it was not aligned with the prophetic tradition. Let's just say that. Now, I want to say something at the same time. I bought this book and I brought some references to try to add a little bit more scholarship to this and for, for the audience, right? To give you so So this particular book here, um, this is the official book from the Nation of Islam under the leadership of Elijah Muhammad. And in, in, in this book, it talks about the ideology of the Nation of Islam. But what I want to just particularly just highlight just for a second, uh, 
this is on page 68 of this book. You can find this book. And, and, and that's important uh, for us as Muslims, especially for us doing da'wah or out, is that the, the core of the deen is in the text. The core of the deen is in the text. So for us, that's in the Quran, right? So I want to mention this particular book here. So, so I want to say something here. Now, in this particular, this was copyrighted. I want to mention this. This book was copyrighted in 1965. Okay, so this book was copyrighted in 1965. So what I'm getting ready to say helps us understand the time period, but it's on page 68 and it said, what is Islam? I want to read what the leader of the nation of Islam, Elijah Muhammad at the time, who's the author of the book, right? What did he say Islam was? <clears throat> so I'll just, I'll just go right here. So it says, while teaching and representing a religion called Islam to you, the first important thing to do is answer the questions. What is Islam? Who is the author? What are its prophets and people? I just want to mention that. So I want to, so I want to go down further, right? So he says, the author of Islam is Allah. I want to mention that, right? Because clearly when, when, when you read the book, you, you'll see mention of Father Muhammad coming in the person of Allah in different parts of the book, right? But when it comes down to what is Islam, Elijah Muhammad's answer here, the author of Islam is Allah. I'll keep reading. We just cannot imagine God being the author of any other religion but one of peace, since peace is the very nature of Allah, and peace he seeks for his people, and peace is the nature of the righteous, right? I want to mention that. And so he mentions this because that's very important here, because now we can see, okay, so when it when asked what is Islam, right, he mentions the religion of peace, but then when, when asked who is the author, he answers that question here very clearly here, and that is Allah. Why am I saying that? So now I want to segue into the leadership of Imam Muhammad. So the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, he passed away um, in February of 1975 as the leader of the Nation of Islam. And then his son, Wadafadi Muhammad, became the leader as he, Elijah Muhammad, at this point, dictated that he wanted the leadership to be succeeded uh, from him to his son. Uh, at this point in time, the name was official name Wallace Muhammad. And I'll get to the name change in the, in the moment because I think that's important as well. So here is Imam Muhammad, Rahimullah Ali, taking over an organization led by his father that did not have beliefs that aligned with the prophetic tradition. So one of the immediate tasks that he took on was to transition this particular organization into the orthodox application of Islam following the prophetic tradition. So just imagine the challenge of that time. And again, we're talking about now 75, bringing everything, because everything, in, and that helps us too, right? When you're looking at something, you have to look at the historical context, but you also have to look at the political context. You also have to look at the cultural context. All of these things are relevant. So I'm giving you this time period as we talk about his leadership and as we move through periods of time, understanding that as the dynamics change in the American culture, right? You could see the focus changing with it, but never deviating from the core of Al-Islam, never deviating from the core of Al-Islam. So one of his first tasks was to help the organization understand the prophetic tradition, right? So they would, they had most of them, the, they were called temples at the time, but they were comprised of churches. So they had pews in the buildings, right? So one of the things that he did was take the pews out of the building, right? And you have to understand, so some people, not everyone now, because when you ask people about the transition, now I was blessed because my father was at this point in the community and witnessed the transition. So what I'm learning, uh, what I'm giving you right now is what my father told me as he was experiencing this 
transformational, not knowing at the time this historical movement, not knowing that you're making history, you're in the moment, right? And he's talking about these different changes that were that were being made that they weren't expecting because one of the things that attracted him to the nation of Islam was its economic program, right? The social program, right? Self-determination, right? The freedom of the mind, freedom of the spirit, freedom of the heart, and the desire to work together in community life for people who seem to be getting no help from anywhere else, right? So he's in this particular movement, and many came for different reasons, and some did not come for the Islamic teachings, because we had the Islamic terminology, but not necessarily in the Islamic teachings. So here comes Imam Muhammad Rahimu Allahu Alayhi, now transitioning us into Orthodox Islam, talking about the five pillars. You coming for economic program. You coming for the political program. You coming for black unity, black power, right? Let's unite as a community. And here comes the leader now saying, yes, those things are still important, but let's talk about the body of five. Because they would pray, but they would pray like this, right? Sure, I turn myself to you, O Allah, right? They would make the prayers like this, but now we know as Muslims, right, or the audience, right, that may be non-Muslim, but for us, this is really dua, right? But this is how they would start off the meeting and close the meeting, and they thought this was prayer, right? So here comes Imam Muhammad Rahim Allah now introducing them to the concept of salah. Now, you have to understand now, so many people were in conflict. I, think I came for the, you know, the, the, all of the other things that the nation offered, excellent things and things that the community needed. Because, again, you're talking to people at this point in time that wasn't getting help from anywhere else. No civil rights, being abused, being put down, and always being thought of less as less than. I'm just talking about the context of the imam. Imam Muhammad, when I say that, we call him affectionately and lovingly Imam, but I want to say it. Imam Muhammad, Rahimullah, as, as the leader now of an organization that had followed only one leader, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and they knew him as the teacher, and now he's introducing some teachings that they were not familiar with. Right. So there was great strife in the, in the leadership, and, and, but, and now the context, right? So his advisors were saying, well, let's. We understand that because he's teaching the whole while as he's sharing with the community, he's also teaching the leaders what orthodox I'm using the term for the audience. Right. We call we're going to call it orthodox. It's not because we know that Sunni and Shia are really are political terms. Right. And for those who want to, want to know that, then we would say, obviously, if they ask, are you Sunni or Shia, which um, none of those really are mentioned in the Quran as how Muslims should follow. But. We know that those terms are out in the public, so I want to address our current context. So we'll use the term Orthodox Islam so that the audience can understand, especially non-Muslims, that we're really talking about following the prophetic tradition, right? We don't use Sunni or Shia as those terms because we know those terms are political terms and they're not reinforced in the Quran. However, if, if asked a question and somebody's pressing and they ask you, are you Sunni or Shia? And this particular point, just so they can try to understand exactly what prophetic tradition we're following, we'll say Sunni. But that's not the term that we use. I'm saying that so that in this conversation, you can kind of understand some of the word context that I'm using that may be a little different from the words that you're using. And I'm saying this because as being part of uh, an effort here that's about Dawa, which we'll get to the Austin Dawa team, that's very important because that, that question is asked all the time. Right. So I'm mentioning that to you. So here is bringing the community into Orthodox, uh, Orthodox Islam, following the prophetic tradition. And so one of the first things that he also did, I'm, I'm saying because he's doing these things because that was not a part of their tradition. That was not a part of the leadership in this organization. So he was doing things that were unfamiliar to people. Right. And you have to look at the context now. We didn't have Google. We didn't have the wealth of knowledge and technology that we have now that you can find information out. You know, you couldn't pull up a YouTube video. Right. So you had to. I'm looking at Osama's and looking at audience. So I, I meant to look here, but I'm just looking around. So forgive me if I take my eyes off the camera. But I'm saying that to say so. Why I'm saying it? Because when you look at his leadership, you have to also look at the context. Leadership in the context, what's going on in the environment. And the beautiful thing about the Quran, the beautiful thing about the Quran is the Quran addresses all situations, no matter where we are in the world, no matter what the historical context, 
no matter what the cultural context, no matter what the political context, no matter what the economical context, no matter what the educational context is, the Quran addresses all these things because Allah is universal. And the beauty of the Quran is when you see how Allah addresses that in the current times and each civilization has that a light that can help it meet its best goals and, and best games under uh, best aims under Allah's guidance. So continue on with this with this context. So one so uh non-African American people were not allowed in the nation of Islam. So bringing the, the community into Orthodox Islam, he comes out and says, we are accepting non-African American members. So you can imagine this organization prided itself on, right, the, the, the help of the downtrodden African American person in the in the society, and they call it in the wilderness of North America. And there's more to say, I'm skipping over large blocks with the understanding that at another point in time, we will obviously dig into details or uh, we can do that in the Q&A. So I want, I, want, I, want to, I want to make sure I'm saying that. So he says that we are now, and so that meant, and so he made it clear. So yes, we are accepting memberships from white Americans. Here, this, this organization that prided itself on black nationalism, he comes out and says, we are accepting memberships from non-African Americans. Now, us as Muslims, we know that the religion is universal. So he's introducing the religious principles of the dean to this uh, new community in a way that was uh, aligned with the current circumstances. Right. So then he would have classes on Sundays. Again, we're talking about in the 75, 76, 77, 78. We didn't have this ability here to have a Zoom call. And he set up conference calls all around the United States. Right. So they had uh, communities, Philadelphia, California, New York, New Jersey, Atlanta, Georgia. Mississippi, Alabama, Texas, Arkansas, New Mexico, right? California, Las Vegas, right? So you're all around the country now. And he's teaching the community at the same time via a, a radio hookup, meaning that he set it up where everybody could dial into a number, not like we have now, right? And they could listen to him give education. And he would begin teaching a religion and starting off with prayer. So he began teaching prayer as it is given in the Quran, following the, the prophetic tradition and exemplified uh, in the last message by the seal of the prophets, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he's explaining the positions of the prayer. He's explaining wudu. He's explaining the adhan. But, now, but, but he, the, here's the beauty. When you listen to lectures and you listen to him teaching, you have to understand who is his audience at this time. And his audience is African American Muslims that only know Christianity as a religion. And they only know the, 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 the tenets of the nation of Islam as taught by Elijah Muhammad. So now he's teaching this and he's teaching it with, with such patience and clarity and detail, and not only explaining the rituals of wudu, right, we'll go into that another, but explaining the meanings of washing the right hand. Why is the right hand first? And why does the left hand wash the right hand? And why are you washing the right hand three times? And why are you washing the left hand three times? And why are you washing the hand before the nose? And why is it the no? And, and, and why is it no? And why is it you washing the hands before the mouth? And why is the mouth before the nose? Right? And explaining all of these things. And why is the you up to the elbow? Right? And why is it the feet? And why is it three times? And why the right? I mean, he's explaining this so that the audience can not only know the rituals, but be able to explain the rituals. Right? I'm going to say this because what is often missed sometimes for people who are not um, reverts, right, or 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 have a community of Muslims that you have access to, 
And you don't take it for granted. It's not that you overlook it, but here's what you have to understand and keep in mind. Most of these people, their family members are not Muslim. And so when they say these things, they're under attack or they're questioned with great detail. So you have to be able to explain these things, right? That's why when you see our approach, it's going to be, man, we're going to explain details because we want you to be able to explain it too, because we understand that most of the time, the people that you're going to be coming in contact with are not Muslims. They don't know the terminology. They don't know, let alone the Arabic itself. So we want to give you the empowerment to be able to explain this in such a way that the people don't think that you're just accepting this religion on emotion. Or that you're just accepting this religion because everybody else around you are this, right? You're talking about accepting this for the light that God is giving and being able to withstand the attack of your own family members, your own friends, your own co-workers, and having people start looking at you strangely and dealing with that, uh, awk those awkward moments, right? And I'm putting it in the context, right? So he's explaining prayer. He's explaining wudu. He's explaining charity. He's explaining now that Elijah Muhammad is not Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa When they were reading the Quran and they see Muhammad, they thought that that Muhammad was Elijah Muhammad. So here is Imam Muhammad explaining that that's not Elijah Muhammad. Elijah Muhammad is a messenger. But Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is a, a nabi. He is a prophet of God. Right. And he is the seal of the prophets. And so I'm saying this now. So now put yourself in the mindset of a people. Who now are going through a whole nother change. They had to go from the life of the church to the nation of Islam, the ideology of the nation of Islam. And now here comes a new leader bringing them into another change. And you can imagine them thinking, well, was I lied to? Was I missed? You can imagine the confusion. Now, how do I know? It's because my father was explaining the conflict that he was in. And I'm sitting and I'm learning and understanding exactly what he was dealing with. And at the same time, right, my mother, she came from a Christian background like he came from a, a Christian background, a daughter of a preacher, right? And they're trying to follow the education and they're living and learning at the same time. Hands on. So I, 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 I go to the temple. Now the name is now changed to Masjid. We used to call them temples. Now you're like, okay, I'm changing. I'm, and you're just changing it. And as you're learning at the same time, but now you got to go home and deal with your people attacking you for taking this new religion that forsaken Jesus. Right? All of these things going on at the same time, your own personal confusion as you're trying to adapt and learn this new way of life. Because keep in mind, they wasn't reading the Quran. So now they're reading this book and now they have to learn this book, but now they have an excellent teacher. So when talking about leadership, the way that he took that community through that transition with patience and insight and love and care and tolerance without the community firing a shot. Right. I'm, I'm going I'm going into what we're talking about when you talk about his context, because people want me to go into his language. No, it's more than that's richer than that. It's so far more far reaching than that. I'm just talking about it on a human level now. Right. So I want to make some notes now. I made some notes. So I want to mention some of these things and then uh, we can wind up. But I, these are things I wanted to mention. So. These are my notes. Imam Walter D. Muhammad born. Uh, October the 10th, 1933, successor of Elijah Muhammad as head of the nation of Islam. One of the first things he did was he moved to inclusion within the worldwide Islamic community. So not only did he say we're going to accept non-African American members, he said, now we're going to now unite with the brotherhood of Muslims all around the globe. Right? So it mentioned the nation of Islam was just a nation unto itself. Now he's open door and talking about we're going to have relationships with all other Muslims, not only in at this particular point he was in Chicago, but all around the globe. So now he, and look how beautiful it is, right? Because we know the religion is universal, right? Allah talks about that. And he talks about Rasulullah Sallallahu as being the universal prophet. But now you're looking at it in a, in a real context in the life of a people who are now going from misunderstanding to understanding and clarity, and they got to live it and apply it right after they learn it, right? So 
the leader of the nation of Islam. So I want to go through the different name changes that the uh, organization went through just for your own uh, notes, and we can cover those things. So uh, originally, it was the nation of Islam. The next, the first thing he did was then he called them Bilalians to unite with one of the wonderful illuminary companions of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Bilal ibn Rabah, the first Muwethan. But he's doing this to get them to see their connection to Islamic history and to see people like them in the story of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Beautiful, insightful methodology. It's a lot of other different things you can mention, but this is to connect the people because keep in mind at the time, we're going through segregation. We'll wait right here. All right. We're going through segregation. We're going through civil rights, right? And now this you're talking about a people who as a whole have low self-esteem. And one of the first things that he does is connecting them with the Islamic history is showing them their role in Islamic history and the universal application of Islamic history and helping them see in Islamic history somebody like them making a sizable contribution to Islam, such as Bilal ibn Rabah radiallahu anhu, right? So that name Bilal was to connect us with our ancient Islamic history and to connect us with our African history because we, as we've learned now, but at that time they didn't know that and it wasn't in history books, that a lot of the Muslims that came over uh, were from Africa. They didn't really teach that, right? You didn't see that in the books. And that's important even now because we have to be more active. That's why programs such as this are so key, so vital, so necessary, so critical as we live in a society that want to remake news, reshape history. So this is a wonderful way that we can preserve our history. And may Allah bless our planners and organizers uh, to be able to have this idea and keep this idea going. And may Allah bless you in your efforts to support this uh, wonderful idea. So he rejected, now, see, he rejected the deification of Wallace Ford Muhammad. He rejected that the person that introduced this religion to Elijah Muhammad, which his name was called Ford Muhammad, is not a god. He's a mortal human being. So he begins addressing this. And we know as Muslims, that's the core of the religion is to reject shirk, false worship, right? So he goes on and he, he does that. He accepted uh, non-African American members. We already mentioned that. Now, he forged uh, ties. I want to mention these because these are major, right? Other things also. He forged major ties with mainstream Muslim communities. He introduced the five pillars into theology, he went from Bilalian to World Community of Islam in the West. Then he went from that to American Muslims. And his final uh, organization was called the Mosque Cares. I want to mention that, the Mosque Cares. So now, that's important because then, because sometimes when we mention this, people immediately assume that we're with the nation of Islam, right? And that's just, we don't understand. Sometimes people see you African-American and they think you with the nation. And that's that's why we have to keep working, right? Uh, and I'm not saying in a dogmatic way, I'm just trying to, I help us understand that sometimes we have stereotypes, right? You see you dressed a certain way and you think that I'm from a nation, from the nation, right? When my dress is really just American dress, the best of American dress, right? The dress of my culture. So I'm saying that now to say so officially. So Louis Farrakhan broke then. His first position was he was the national spokesman for me, man, Walter D. Muhammad, but then he broke from the movement that was taking the community into Orthodox Islam. And he broke from this. He didn't start the Nation of Islam right away. That came later, but he originally broke from this uh, Orthodox movement under the prophetic tradition. And then later on, then he would revise the Nation of Islam. Okay, So that helps us understand. So the Nation of Islam once was under the leadership of Elijah Muhammad. When he passed away, Imam Muhammad Rahimullah took the whole movement into Orthodox Islam and disbanded that particular name. And we were then at this point now, Muslims, right? These uh, phrases that he gave us was just really to help us as we transition into this new way of life, to help us be mindful that we didn't have to lose our culture. 
We didn't have to lose our identity as a people. As a matter of fact, Islam comes to, comes to elevate the best of a culture. It does not say that you have to do away with your cultural traditions that does not conflict with the best of the Islamic uh, principles and the best of the, the prophetic tradition. So I wanted to mention that because I think that's important talking about that. So he broke away from the this movement here. At this point in time, it was the uh, this organization at the time here was the uh, World Community of Al-Islam in the West. So when it was World Community of Al-Islam in the West, uh, uh, Minister Louis Farrakhan left the organization here, right? So the organization kept going. I wanted to mention these things. So one of the things that he also did uh, was now begin to have what we know now as interfaith dialogue. So he would then begin to have open dialogue with ministers, rabbis, leaders of the heavenly religions of Judaism, of Judaism and Christianity. And when you look at the Sira, right, you can see beautifully the Imam's tactics, right? Because we know that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on two different occasions, three different occasions, really, he encountered large groups from different faiths, right? Abyssinia is one, a, a Christian delegation in Mecca, and then a Christian delegation in Medina, right? So he had this open dialogue in the masjid, right? And when he uh, opened the charter of Medina, I'm just talking about how the Imam, when I'm saying Imam Muhammad, how he was using strategies to bring about Islamic awareness with the people who didn't understand this, but keep them connected with their human identity as, as, as a, a soul that's not born in sin, but also helping them not think that they needed to dawn on someone else's culture, they could keep their culture as well, right? The best of the culture, right? Islam doesn't say all cultures are bad, but Islam comes to elevate the culture. And so in any culture, vulgarity is bad. Indecency is bad. So Islam cover, comes to elevate the elements of modesty, modesty in the way we dress and even the head, right? We cover the head as Muslims as a sign of respect for the universal knowledge in the Quran and not putting our knowledge ahead of Allah's knowledge. So it is a reminder that I'm to be shaped by the knowledge that Allah gives in the light of the Quran and exemplified leadership in Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi It humbles us that that mind is the mind we want to dawn on and not necessarily how we think or perceive things. And we don't put our perception ahead of what Allah is presenting in, in the Quran. And Allah talks about that when he says it's making things clear. It's helping us in our perception, in our culture perception, in our economic perception, in our political perception, in our perception, and I'm saying education, but I'm going to go a little deeper now, in our perception of science, that science is not separate from religion because Allah is the creator of the universe and these resources, the risk is his, using terms that we're familiar with. And for those who are not, risk means the provisions. Okay. Um. So he began to had this interfaith dialogue, which is now where we're coming in now, right? And so he would open up the masjid for dialogue for people of different faiths to come in the masjid, look around, right? See that it's not a threat, right? Keep in mind, because, you know, a lot of times, uh, depending on, not a lot of times, right? Sometimes when Islam is presented, it's presented as a threat to human decency, human life, the American culture, all these different things. And a lot of that is done out of ignorance. And that's why it's so important what we're doing. It's so critical what we're doing, right? So I'm making that point. So I'm just making these other notes. So he, so one of his focuses was universal teachings of the social community, how we are now a social community, but how we are a global community and how my brother and sister are not just the brother and sister sitting next to me, but it is my brother and sister the ones who say, la ilaha illallah, no God except Allah, and Muhammad is his message. Bringing me into that and seeing a person that doesn't have my skin tone, my cultural experiences, and see them as my brother, right? He's bringing us into this big level of understanding and keeping in mind, in the context, the people that he's talking to didn't feel like they were anybody's brother because the world didn't treat the people like they were a brother, right? 
They ridiculed them, made lies about their ability to learn, right? And so you, all of these stereotypes that came with people that were considered African-American, they couldn't lead, they couldn't learn, they couldn't think. Even just looking at pros, right? I can mention this. Even right now, as we see uh, in NFL, if you, for those who look at that, right, the, the evolution of the African-American quarterback. A at one time, they said that if you were African-American, you couldn't play quarterback because you weren't smart enough to learn the position. You had to be a wide out or a defensive back. And so meaning you can only use your speed. You can only use your body, but you couldn't use your mind. You, it's like, like somehow your mind was different than the mind of everyone else. Right. And just understand being attacked and assaulted. At. That's why when I look at some of these things, the beautiful things that we were able to do with education that we'll get a chance to have. And I'll, I'll mention these books of references, but I want to mention universal Islamic teachings on the social community. Right. His commentary on the Quran and the Sunnah. What did he do to advance the clear understanding of Islam in the world, bringing peace and cooperation with all good? and God-loving people. So this was the strategy, and this allowed us to then begin to have relationships with people of other faith traditions. And the interfaith, uh, as we're seeing it now, you're talking about at this time, there was that was not being done, right? And he was being criticized for do, even doing that, letting non-Muslims come into the masjid, right? But how are people going to learn about Islam if they don't see Islam in a natural setting, right? Juma is not the time for that. Right. Think about it. We give the rituals. We give a chutzpah introduction. It's in all Arabic, a personal no Arabic. So 15 minutes of the chutzpah, they don't even know what you're saying. Right. We know what we're saying, but somebody's coming. Just imagine you invite a guest to Juman. Now they can watch the prayer, but really half of the chutzpah. Right. The, the first part of the introduction in the first half, the second part of the introduction, the second half. That's all Arabic. Right. And you're going into if you and if you recite the Islamic sources. So just think of the meat of the chutbah is in Arabic. So somebody that is that does not speak that their level of being able to take that and apply that, they can only really get about 10 minutes of the Juma, really. And if we break it down and make it simple, then probably 10. But otherwise, they could they'll see us pray together. But 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 listen, even that is doubt. Right. A law will strike the hearts. Right. I'm just helping us really understand what we mean and why. Right. It's necessary for us to have uh, other organizations that offer programs throughout the week for grassroots people to come in and learn about Islam, knowing that they're not a Muslim, but maybe they're on their way to being a Muslim and prepare them to maybe be in a masjid and understand why we have these Islamic etiquettes within the houses of God, the institutions of God, right? But they can come into a place like this of high learning and come as they are. There's no dress code here. You want to learn about Islam, you can come right here as you are. Now, obviously, you have to be clothed, right? But we want you to have access to learning the religion. And then maybe in time, you will want to visit a masjid, a house of worship, right? But first, maybe you just want to know a few questions. Maybe you just want to understand what it is and be comfortable and be able to ask some questions so that you don't feel intimidated entering a masjid, right? So that's what the Austin Dowell Center is about, is about teaching Islam on the basic level, starting with the clarity of the religion and understanding that the principles of the religion are the foundation of the religion and understanding that most of the American speaking people do not understand the principles of the religion. Even when we give it to them, sometimes we'll just give them like, for instance, right? And we, we're just used to talking to Muslims. We'll say Islam is five, right? We'll say Shahada. Maybe not, and maybe, and maybe explain it, but not that much. Shahada to witness God is one. Hey, somebody that's just hearing it for the first time, whoa, 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 what do you mean, right? That requires a little bit more, right? To prayer, salah, five times a day. Whoa, whoa, five times, right, right? To to practice charity, right? Zakat, zakat, right? To practice fasting. Fasting, okay, in a month, y'all fast a whole month? So if people think you fast and they think you go a whole month without eating. Right. They don't understand that, hey, that's from sunrise to sunset. Right. And, and, and what's the benefit of that? And that yet not and our fasting has evolved from how Allah introduced the fasting originally. And that also for us married people means that we avoid the intimacy with our spouses until the lawful times when the sun has set. Right. And then this last one, Hajj. Right. 
It's not just pilgrimage to the house, but the pilgrimage represents the unity of mankind, the oneness of mankind, and how Allah sees us as one and that all of us matter in the grand scheme of things, even though if you just took a big, big global picture, 3,000 degrees up, you couldn't even see us. We're a speck of dust in the galactical system. But to Allah, Allah sees us as one and all lives matter. Right. So we want to have this interaction with people and be able to answer questions and make ourselves available during the week when people get off work and try to make it at times that work for them on Friday during the day. When we have our Juma times, many people are working and they might don't have time to get off for the masjid and maybe the job might not let them off because they're not a Muslim, but they want to learn about the religion. So we have to create opportunities to engage the American audience. We are one percent of the American audience here. We, the Muslims, are 1%. So we have to make ourselves available to the 99% and not depend on other sources that are not Muslim to present the Islamic picture to the people of what Islam is. That is a responsibility that Allah has invited us to take up that is a responsibility that we don't take lightly. I mean, we, anybody who is out here trying to share this religion, any organization around the globe, we have taken this, when we've taken this, hoping that Allah will accept this of us. So I'll pull up here. Uh, so just a few things. So the Austin Dial Center here located in Austin, our goal is to present the clear picture of Al-Islam in its foundation, in its, in its fundamentals, and create avenues for people to have economic dignity, right? Workshops on entrepreneurship, workshops on getting into some of the, the fields, the technical fields, the medical fields, the legal fields. Some of these fields where if you look at the numbers, African-Americans don't pursue these particular fields and they've been intimidated and feeling like these positions uh, don't fit them. So we want to create opportunities to also create community wealth. We also want to create the opportunity for us to be entrepreneurs so that we can free ourselves up on Friday to come to the Juma and also on a bigger picture so we can free ourselves up to support all of our institutions that need our help now. Right? Donating to this effort, uh, Muslim space, and then finding a resource. So if, if you haven't given, we, that we need your support. The organization needs your support, whether it be you... Uh, participating and watching, or if you can't be here, you can donate, right? No amount is too big, no amount is too small. Um, so back to the Austin Dial Center. So that is our role. And so we want to work with all God conscious people and also not just Islam, but all of the religions are being misrepresented. So there's a work for all of us in this particular effort to present what God has, when we say clearly, we mean what God has presented in the scriptures as what the religions are, not some of the sound bites that we hear from people who don't necessarily represent um, our religion. And so we look forward to uh, working with you all. I'm so excited about our opportunities to do uh, collective work together as it relates to just anything that we think will uplift people, right? Whether it be young adults, whether it be parents, whether it be business people, whether it be uh, people that are in politics, whether it be people in the medicine field, maybe be people in the legal field. This way of life as a law is presented in the Quran addresses all of these particular aspects of life. So before I close, I want to mention some books that will help you in understanding our community. So one, and there's no order, but I'll start with this one. This is an excellent book. It is called America's, America's Imam by Salahuddin Muhammad. And it talks about the strategies of Imam Muhammad when he became the leader of the nation of Islam and transitioning them from a non-clear understanding of Al-Islam, a segregated understanding of Al-Islam into a broad understanding and intellectual understanding where now many of these members in the community are now leaders in their own rights, judges, scholars, uh, Arabic teachers, businessmen and women, doctors, lawyers, right? Entrepreneurs, right? But still connecting with the community life. The next book is in two parts. It is called Mother of a Nation, 
It is by Dr. Zakia Muhammad. She was also wrote the curriculum uh, for the Clara Muhammad schools. Okay. Um, I want to mention this because you may want to research her. Dr. Zakia Muhammad was the founder of the Institute of the American of the Muslim American Studies. She earned an EDA, a, a EDD from Columbia University and is credited with writing the first dissertation of Islamic schools in America. So this is the person who wrote the curriculum for our Clara Muhammad schools. I wanted to get you in case you, there's a picture over here in the back, Dr. Zakia Muhammad. So this is the book called Mother of uh, a Nation. So this talks about <clears throat> the wife of Elijah Muhammad, the mother of Imam Walafa Dean Muhammad, and how she was instrumental in the Islamic schools. So one of the other things about Imam Muhammad Rahimullah, so he never went to public school. He was homeschooled. And he had an Arabic teacher. And he learned Islam from Arabic teachers and scholars that Elijah Muhammad brought over and taught in the nation of Islam, right? So some of these things that are maybe not misunderstood or taken for granted, because people immediately want to ask, where, where did you get your scholarship from? Right. And so and I understand you thinking, OK, well, if your family's not Muslim, how did you learn the religion? Right. Well, Elijah Muhammad. Brought scholars in. And when they had the Muhammad schools, the Islamic scholars were teaching the lessons. So we learned these particular components of al-Islam. And so Imam Muhammad, Rahimullah, Allah blessed him. Right. To keep going and studying into the sciences of the deen, into the grammar of the Quran into the prophetic tradition and give him a sound scholarly grasp of these things. Next book I want to mention is called A History of Muslim African Americans. It's by the Islamic History Project Group. Excellent book. And it talks about the, the history of Islam in the African community and how it made its way to America. Okay. Again, the book is called A History of Muslim African Americans, Islamic History Project Group. We already mentioned this one, a message to the black man by Elijah Muhammad to understand the ideology of the nation of Islam. Beautiful book. This is called My Name is Omar, The Life and Struggle for Liberation. Right. And this is one of the slaves from Africa who came over to America. But later got his freedom and told the story of his, of his enslavement and also told the story of the struggles of many people that tried to keep their Islam. Beautiful, beautiful story. The people that came over here that were enslaved against their will, they didn't just give up their Islam. As a matter of fact, they fought for their Islam. In one of the writings in the book, he describes a Hafiz who is writing in the dirt, because they wouldn't, the master would not the 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 well, uh, the the person who was over the enslaved people. I want to change the terminology. The person that was these people were enslaved. They weren't slaves. They were enslaved people. So the person who was over the enslaved people, they wouldn't let him read. So what many of them had to do was to keep memorizing the Quran. They had to write it in the dirt so that if he came. They can erase it and they couldn't see that they were trying to keep their knowledge of the Quran. And they, and they wouldn't let them write in Arabic. They wouldn't let us congregate any of these things. And so one of the final things is it was written in one of the journals. The Hafiz said, I'm crying because I see that my memory of the Quran is fading. And so we know Allah says that he hears those who call out on him. We know that at some point the people, the enslaved people realized that they probably was not going to see freedom. But we believe that in their prayers, they prayed to Allah that their descendants would one day find this religion again. And they would not only find this religion, but pick it up with vigor. Pick it up and be willing to be the vanguards. Pick it up and be willing to be courageous and live this religion in a society that is not that religion. And we believe that Allah has answered their prayers with our presence. And we pray that Allah will continue to bless us in this effort and allow us to unite with good-willed people of all faiths, all sober-minded people, men and women, so that we can work to elevate the society 
in seeing its best human mold as Allah has described in the Quran and as demonstrated by our leader, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So there's more to say. Um, we look forward to uh, presenting a little bit more slides and more information. Um, this was really just meant to be an overview and, and maybe uh, provoke some questions and answers and begin the dialogue. The beauty about this religion is you learn from people when you have dialogue with it. A man was in the presence of Omar and said he knew a man, knew another man, and, and Omar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu asked him, okay, well, have you traveled with him? The man said no. He said, well, have you done business with him? He said no. He said, well, have you been to his home? The man said no. So Omar didn't say, well, you don't know him. And so these wonderful, intimate uh, settings that we have here allowing us to come into your home and be able to have this conversation, we hope that these conversations continue and only good can come from it, inshallah. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair, Imam. We appreciate it. Uh, inshallah, we'll have some questions and uh, that'll be coming in. Some yes, that have come from the audience uh, and you know some that just come up in the course of it. But first of all, just you know, thank you, Jazakallah khair, for a really um, detailed, informative kind of deep dive into uh, the life of Imam Waradi Muhammad, rahimullah and, uh, and that's just scratching the surface, right? Yes, like I said, ne 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 next time we'll have slides, yeah. inshallah, we'll, we'll dump all that. But there, there's so much more uh, to, to, to take, but I think as you were identifying, so much that's relevant um, to yes. our context, even yes. at the decades. Um, so just to, just to kind of jump into uh, some of the questions that we've got uh, coming in here, uh, you talked a little bit about this, but I'm wondering if you could share for us um, with respect to Imam Wardi Muhammad, how did he come to embrace Orthodox Islam, Al Islam? Were there particular influences or a driving force that pushed him uh, to change the understanding and practices of uh, the nation of Islam? Uh, if I recall correctly, I, I believe one of uh, Elijah Muhammad's sons, I believe Akbar Muhammad, had studied at Al Azhar. And, you know, they yes. had this exposure, like you mentioned, you kind of go into the space. Yes. And uh, I believe Imam Wardi Muhammad as well kind yes. of had a uh, a back and forth in terms of uh, before becoming uh, the supreme minister of uh, the nation of Islam. But I wonder if you could share a little bit about um, how he came to eventually embrace full on uh, as the leader um, into this space. Um, so I can give it in his words. Um, and that is, is that as I begin to, so so keep in mind now, he had scholars um, that was teaching him the religion. And he was in Islamic school. So meaning his, his whole life was really Islam, right? Had jobs, but really he could really be a student, right? And so one of the professors, Jamil Diab, right? So when 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 they would take lessons from the Quran, Take a lesson from the Quran. He he said that he would then read the Quran, but now he's reading the Quran in Arabic. And he's making the connections of how Allah is presenting the concepts in the Quran. And then dealing with whatever Allah blessed him with in terms of the insights of what Allah was showing him in his understanding of the Quran and application in the context of the society that he was living in. And what he wanted to make sure, what he said is what he wanted to make sure is that throughout all of this, the people who have been put down still keep their human dignity. So I can imagine that as you read the Quran, right, how you see the Quran is going to going to be based on several things, your sensitivities, your level of education, your level of understanding. And then also the last part that Allah talks about about the Quran, which is the key to it all, your sincerity. So I would say that he never traveled overseas uh, in terms of the influence. Now, he went as a leader and he met with different leaders of Saudi Arabia and Morocco. So you, so you can uh, uh, take it, take this one. So now he's traveling to Muslim countries and he's singing. He said he saw what was good in those societies and he saw where the, where the areas of opportunity were, right, as with any society. So he took those things and incorporated that then in the the life that we have here in America, which, which was his core uh, audience was because that was the people that he was leading. So you have to remember, so he really went around the world, really, and he met with leaders around the world and met on 
and sat on large uh, Islamic uh, sure boards and Islamic leadership boards and had a chance to really sit with top leaders and dialogue those things. Sheikh Ibn Ibn Bass, Ibn Ibn Bass, right? Uh, uh, Sheikh Ahmed Guftaro, these people that he had a chance to be around and talk leadership strategies. And one of the things that he said that specifically is that those leaders encouraged him to keep that authentic American identity in the West. Um, and so I just, I wanted to mention that. So you may have more questions about that. So yes, he had a professor and then, but really it was his study of the Quran and the insights from the Quran, as, as he says, specifically in Arabic. And he also mentioned that he also studied mythology and he could see how the religions had fallen into a mythology and how Allah was bringing out those particular elements that was plaguing the, 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 the mind of humanity. And when we mean a mind of man, I mean the, 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 the common man's ability to grasp scripture. The common man's ability to grasp scripture. What do I mean by that? I mean a person that's not a doctor, not a, not a lawyer, not a member of the ulema, not on the board, not a shiuch, a common everyday person that opens up the book and won't light for his life that wants light for her life. And so he mentioned that. He said, and this book frees the mind. It frees the mind of the servant of God from culturalism, any type of ism. And it frees the mind of the servant to see God as the benefactor and to see God as the redeemer. Uh, I hope that answers that. Thanks, Thanks so much, Imam. Uh, the next question we have is that, uh, is pertaining to Austin Dawa Center. So maybe we speak a little bit to this, uh, that uh, the question is that does the Austin Dawa Center face any obstacles when interacting with other Muslim communities? Yeah, uh, yes. You like to share a little well, bit? I, 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 it, that's so broad. I want, I want that person to, to tell me specifically what areas, and we can talk about them, there, that, that, you know, that's a deep answer. And I want to give that person the opportunity to ask me, we can explore it. Because I, 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 the answer is yes, on many levels. Definitely. So, um, you know, we definitely if that, uh, if, if we got that here, um, feel free to uh, put that in the chat. We can, we can, if there's specific yes, uh, challenges, we can definitely yes. dive into that. Right. Um, the other question we've got that, that came in, uh, here is, uh, again, with respect to uh, Imam uh, Warth Dean Muhammad, yes. but with respect to what you mentioned, the uh, splinter that came with uh, the, the division with uh, Minister Louis Farrakhan yes. um, after uh, he had left um, yes. the community. Uh, one, the question was, uh, when was that in terms of uh, the years? I believe you mentioned that 1975. Is, 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 so, 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 so the Imam became uh, Imam Muhammad, thank you for being with me on that. So Imam Muhammad became the leader of the Nation of Islam in 1975. So around 1978, 1979, uh, Minister Louis Farrakhan at that point ceased being a member of this point, the American Muslim Mission in the West. I think that was the name of the community at that time. And then in 1980, he... Um, became the official leader of the Nation of Islam. So he broke away 78, 79, and 1980, leader of the Nation of Islam. So that was around that time. So he broke away 78, 79, then the, the leader of Nation of Islam, uh, 80. Yeah. And uh, for, from what you understand, what you know, did the, how, how did this, uh, this, you know, this kind of split that initially occurred yes. um, with Imam Warthi Muhammad, but then under his leadership, uh, from going from the Nation of Islam yes. um, to a new community, yes. but now the Nation of Islam being reborn. Yes. Um, it, did, did, was the Nation of Islam in its second kind of manifestation in this space, were there any uh, any kinds of changes that had occurred um, that, that, had, that, that Louis Farrakhan now implemented within this new nation of Islam, or was it very much a, uh, a, a kind of a recreation of what Elijah Muhammad had set up? Excellent. This is getting really good. But, um, so it's twofold. So what was the main rift 
the main rift was the people who came into the nation of Islam felt that Imam Waratuddin Muhammad, at this time, Waas Muhammad, left the teachings of his father. That's the rift. And what the truth of the matter is, is that Imam Muhammad left the non-Islamic teachings of his father, but he did not leave everything that Elijah Muhammad had put in place because some of many of those principles are Islamic principles and are usable and they don't violate the laws of Islam, right? You about to send me on tangent, so I'm gonna try to answer short, but we can always come back. I, I, we could we could do this all day because it's an important question. So the issue was the Imam had to choose, like Abraham had to choose. Go with God or follow my father. And he chose to go with Allah. And so to your point, yes, that came with it, just like in the Quran. The prophet had him choosing to go and they try to talk to him. Oh, right. Well, let's just teach this sometime. And you know what I mean? They, the, 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 the Quraysh, they, they, they loved the prophet. He was one of their own. It was like, let's work this out. So, so yes. And Imam was saying it. He, so it's, why am I saying it? See, when we read the scriptures, we can see it comes alive. It comes up. It is not just about 1400 years ago. And right now people are, are having that issue right now. Somebody, somebody probably just became a Muslim yesterday and have to deal with this with their family because their family thinking you leaving us. And they don't understand that I have to obey God. And sometimes that's going to put us at odds if you don't obey God too. It's a problem. So the, the main rift was people felt like he left some of the economic ideas, right? But he really didn't. The real issue was he's bringing us into the religion of the Arabs because they didn't understand, right? And they thought he was bringing us into Mohammedism, right? But really, he was bringing us into the religion for the human nature. So I'm sure you shake your head. You can understand as an African-American, you fought this hard and to gain your freedom and to gain your independence as a black person. And it looks like he's bringing you into another culture that's not your own. If you don't have an understanding, that could look problematic. It could look hypocritic. It could look like a lot of things. But the bottom line was. The Imam, Imam Muhammad had to decide whether to keep following what he was seeing in the Quran and what he was seeing demonstrated in the prophet's life or stick to some of the teachings that his prophet gave that he saw contradicted that. And that's a hard walk for any of us. I can say that because my dad had to do that. Man, he changed his name. I'm only Sharif because my dad became Sharif. He wasn't born Sharif. He was born Flanagan. You understand what I'm saying, Osama? So he had to make a decision, change his name and have his whole family think he done cut himself off the family tree. I'm, I'm making it a real example, right? That's the man, that's on a high level. What about the, just the local level, the common man's level? He had to change his name, but he thought, and he said it, I'm doing this for the future of Islam and my family, not even knowing that we would continue. He, he, Allah didn't show him a crystal ball that I'm doing this. He didn't, so I wasn't even here. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about what you got to do, but why faith matters. But you don't have a whole lot of support. You just had a lot, the knowledge you have, and now you got to fight the people that are in your circle. It's Muslim women right now that are interested in this religion. The only reason why they don't come is because they're scared of the criticism that they would get from the people that are around them. And they're scared of being ostracized. That's why we have to do a better job of understanding that these people are alone and that's not easy to do. When you got Muslims around you all the time, somebody make this decision and, and immediately they don't have no family members, no friends, and they're wondering what their life is gonna be like. It's easy to say, oh, just do this. Yeah, it's easy for you to say. So 
Their main issue was that they felt that he, that's what they said. He left the teachings of the father. But what he left was the teachings that were un-Islamic. You cannot have an organization for just black people. That's not Islamic. You can't exclude white people. That is un-Islamic. You can't say that a person came as God in a person. That is un-Islamic. We're supposed to pray five times a day. We're supposed to embrace anybody around the world that says, I am Muslim. And if they need shelter, we're supposed to give them shelter. This is not about what your race is. It's about our allegiance to Allah and our uh, uh, compliance with following the prophetic leadership. I might have went along. That was a good one. Very uh, good. It reminds me of that quote from MLK. It says, faith is uh, taking that first step, even if you don't see the whole staircase. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Uh, the, 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 the other question that came in was actually, it's now connected to the, uh, the question about the challenges Austin Dawa Center may faces in the community and spe specifies to challenges in feeling welcomed and being given opportunities to collaborate with other Muslim groups. Yes. So let's talk about one of them. In our community right now, the Austin Dial Center. Most of the members are either, well, that's growing. Well, let me just, th there's tears. Exactly changing. You have the Muslim that they are the only Muslim in their family. That's a tear. There's a few of, of our community members are like that. They're the first, first Muslim and only Muslim. Two, second generational Muslim, and they're looking to um, embrace their Islamic identity within the Muslim framework. And then you have the third group, which is they were, uh, their grandparents are Muslims, and they're in the age of uh, sameness. This is an age of sameness. We're all the same and you know, it's a, you know, chill, take a chill, calm down. It's not that serious. Really, we, we, religion is too serious and da-da-da-da-da, right? And so that group, and we have that group as well. So, so within our framework, what is important is not just unity. It is the equality part. Inviting the person not just to sit on the floor, but be part of the decisions. Right. You want to see a diverse community? Okay, look at the people that are not sitting on the floor. That's, that's one level, but that's the small level. Look at the people that are making the decisions. What do they look like? I like you, man. You know, I see you on the smile. Of my... What do they look like? That's how you can tell. Okay, are they all one race? Are they all one gender? Are they all one economic status? Right? So I'm, I want to peel back a layer of the onion. If you ask, I'll answer. I just don't want to just start with a general conversation, and that's not what you're wanting. But I will give, I'm talking, I will, you ask, if you ask the question, I will definitely answer it. You know, but there's just so many layers. I want to only, I want to speak to what your level of sensitivity is instead of just going through my whole story because that may not be your experience and I want to relate to your experience and I want to help you become better. I want to help you become stronger. I want to help you have a larger impact. We need that. So did I answer that question on uh, the uh, obstacles? Because I can go deeper. I just, I want to... Uh, one layer, maybe further than that. Um, that that you, know, you named challenges with respect to some of the with, with respect to the community members that might face right organization you know, right with other Muslim organizations. Uh, you all know, felt any of that kind of difficulty, uh, <laughs> collaboration obstacles. Um, you know, got too deep into it, but in in in, in that sense, uh, yes, yes, uh, yes. Um, and and that is getting better. I've been here since 2011. And 
we have, I mean, what I mean, we, I, I'm talking about now African American Muslim leadership. I'm not, I'm not just talking about Austin Dallas because we represent African American Muslim leadership. And in this religion, that should be, that's what you see on Hodge. Scholars just don't come from one place. Scholars just don't come from one group, right? And so what I want to, I want to mention that because that's at the heart of it. The respect for African-American, not, and not, not African. If they see you from Senegal, oh, right, it's different. No, I'm talking about, um, I am, I'm born here. <clears throat> And I'm generations moved from being taken across to show us. I'm talking about the attitude towards that specifically, not my skin color, but that I have that skin color and I'm from the West is what I'm specifically talking about right now as the other level. It's not the color. I think, I think, cause I think, Generally, our community, they respect knowledge. But if they see you are from America, they might look at you a little differently. And that's what where our problem is. But I don't even think it's their fault. I think that ideology is put there from somewhere because it's not in the Quran and it's not demonstrated in the life of Prophet Muhammad. So I don't want to try to pick on my brothers and sisters because we, you know, we 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 working it out. I, we, we're working through some of our issues too. Your circumstances shape the way you see things sometimes. So yes, and specifically as it relates to African American leadership. So specifically, so we were asked to work with other organizations. I won't say the names, but they wanted us to, uh, they wanted to engulf us. You come over here, you can do your programs and you could teach and that's, and, so it's, and that's what you don't, I say, obviously you don't get it. I don't need you to make a place for me to teach in a land where my ancestors have already spilt their blood for. What favor do you think you're doing me? You don't even open that door for me. You're out of bounds. That's your, your thought process is un-Islamic. What am I saying or something? I'm saying sometimes they think that they're opening up a door for you that belongs to Allah, right? So yes, I could teach, but not as a leader. They're, so they're not treating people like me as a thinker, as a person that has insight and understanding and plans for the progress of Islam. You could just be a mouthpiece. And so I would never have you reduce what God has given me to just on my vocals. God made my mind. God made my heart. And Allah gave me this spirit. I don't know if I went too long or went too deep on the onion with that one. <laughs> the, 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 the tears that start to come from peeling the onion. Start to yeah. say, right? oh, that's all good. Uh, that, that, no, that, that hits spot on. I appreciate you loosening it up and see folks in the audience as well uh, really hitting that. And so I think that that definitely, I'm gonna, we're going to footnote that for the second session. That, that's where the, the onion will get a little bit deeper. Yes. Um, yes. We, we, we got, uh, I think, uh, a couple last questions here. Um, and so... Uh, yeah, all good. Um, this one, this one might 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 bring in a little bit of your bias here, uh, brother, brother Chance. Uh, uh, Samuel, like brother Chance, he he sends a question to us that do you feel like African American Muslims should follow Brother Malcolm X Shabazz in kind of how his converting to Orthodox Islam instead of following the Nation of Islam as he did while uh, completing Hajj? Um, I, I, I'm. I need him to ask me, that's too general for me. I wanna, if there's something specific he wants to know and I'll answer it. I just wanna flush it out a bit because, because you need both. The, 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 because the, the, the pre-Hodge Malcolm is the searching Malcolm. You don't never wanna lose that, right? The pre-Hodge Malcolm is the Malcolm that had been influenced by a culture, had been in a culture. How do you erase that when you come out of that? That will cause you to lose your ability to do dawah effectively, right? 
Let's use the one that we can all relate to. What in the Quran does Allah mention that the Prophet was an orphan? That's pre-Islam. That's pre the that's pre the revelation. He mentions it in the re in the revelation. I don't expect you to answer. I'm, I'm getting ready to answer. And so the reader is mindful of things about the Prophet that Allah knew about the Prophet that Allah was staying, um, was letting the letting the Prophet know that I know that it's a sensitivity in you, but it drives you. It causes you to see the way the things the way that you see. Now we know the tradition. We talk about it all the time. Said he was the last person picked, Osama. All all of the other uh, babies had uh, 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 what, what what's the term they use? They had uh, 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 wet nurse. What is that the term? They had wet nurses. They all had them, but because his father was dead, he got picked last. But who did he end up being? So my point to you, he was always on his way to becoming that. You don't get to Hodge without going through the stages. So I guess the answer would be you need both. Because without that pre-Hodge Malcolm, you wouldn't have the courage. He was fearless. You, he didn't get that from Hodge. He already had that because he had battled it out on the streets. He had seen People put down. In other words, Malcolm realized he had nothing to lose at that point. Take that out of him. You got somebody that, that can talk it, but when it comes time to really back it up and defend, I don't see you. Right? We don't just need lecturers. We need people that are willing to get on the front line and fight for it if we got to. A lot of us can talk it, but only a few of us will actually get out there. What I mean by that? Put your life on the line for the dean. I don't mean anything destructive. I mean, and because really some of us are really scary. We got knowledge, but we're really scary. If, if I'm in an environment where most of the people that I'm in think like me, I'm good. But what? Am, well, well, how you look when you're the only one? That's, that is, a, I'm using a term that people that study them out. That's Detroit Red. <laughs> right? You, you, you have a person that has all of the potential, but not the exposure. And what you constantly see in the beautiful life of this person is that as he learned better, he did better with his understanding and his treatment of people. But because he had that sensitivity, when he left Hodge, he went back, right back into those underserved communities because he saw the life that they was living. So you need both of those within the human being, inshallah. But you definitely want the enlightenment. But what shapes you is your story and it's unique and it's a beautiful story that Allah takes us through these different circumstances so that we can have the sensitivities that we need to engage the world. Yeah, no, absolutely, Zakwa. Well, that's that uh, speaks so much to uh, just that 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 importance of of you know being able to walk your faith authentically. The Prophet is 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 you know his his life didn't start all over at at age forty. He was still the person they knew as that you know that merchant, that uh, trader, the person who was trustworthy, who was that orphan, the shepherd, and whatnot. But that informed um, that that walk of life. You know, may Allah guide us to that 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 light that uh, Malcolm X Al Hajj Malik Al Shabazz. Um, received, but also being informed by by not shedding that those experiences, not shedding those feathers that they grew. Um, yeah. yeah. Plus, right? We'll be and we leave. No knock. Sometimes we will learn, and we we will stop helping those people who are outside of the margins. And your relationships can take you there. You get around people, and they have. And so you get used to that and you forget about the people who are outside the margins and you'll start forgetting that there are people outside the margin. That's the worst mistake we can do is to forget that there's people outside the margins. There's people outside the margins right now. And those people are the ones who need our help. Absolutely. Absolutely.
<laughs> good, we came ready. Uh, we, we, no, all good. We got we got two last questions, inshallah. And as as we mentioned, we'll definitely be continuing this conversation in a part two, yes, uh, just because there's so much to, to unpack. But um, first of the last questions that we've got here is talking a little bit more uh, kind of back to the community of Imam Warat Din Muhammad yes. um, present day. Uh, you know, you, you mentioned how uh, this community was also going through uh, as Imam uh, Warat Din was shepherding it, uh, was kind of rediscovering its identity, was helping yes. to build that foundation yes. from Bilalians to, uh, you know, the American uh, Islamic community in the West or yes. so. And so building on that, that uh, element here, yes. um, where is the community uh, kind of located now in a sense, located more in a uh, metaphorical sense. But uh, I believe Imam Warthin passed away in 2008. Yes. Um, and so where, where where is the community now in terms of its maybe name, its apparatus? And was is there, was there any successorship to uh, in the leadership of the community from Imam Warthin uh, Muhammad to uh, anyone after him? So just want to learn a little bit about Excellent. where the community is Excellent. now. And yes, Excellent. go from there. Excellent. Uh, so it's a few layers. So I'll probably start with the one. So uh, so we we have still our national community um spanning from from Texas to New Mexico from California to um New York um and so we have regular um regional meetings I'm talking about the, the community at large and we discuss the matters in our community as it relates to going to the next step for us. And so on a, on, on a whole, uh, if, I, if I put it in some groups, working on now is the helping our organizations and masajids and Islamic institutions um, get to the situation where they can generate money to stay in operation, <clears throat> perfect the techniques and those different things uh, that's one level. Uh, number two, <clears throat> the reconnecting, I, 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 I'll be careful my language, the reconnecting with our current generation in a way that we see the value in each other for the collective work in marching in the dean for the next group behind. Meaning the, you got the young adults, 26, 27, 28, right? 30s. So you got to mid, let's go. So you got mid 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, pioneers, those. I'm not talking about the person right now you can't vote. Getting ourselves ready to prepare the, that group for the leadership and understanding now what should be the priorities because we're bombarded with so many different things. And having that conversation collectively where we bring everybody to the table so that you can have an enriched conversation because what makes a conversation enriched is when everybody's at the table. When everybody's not at the table, there is a voice or a point of view or a need left out. And then when that need and that voice and that reposition, uh, representation is left out at leadership, you'll see it in your community's attendance. If you want to look at your community or whatever you're doing and you see who's not there, then go back and see whoever's not there that you're looking for, see if that presence is in your leadership. More than likely, you'll see that presence is not in the leadership, and that's why you don't see it on the other level either. Um, so, 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 so one, uh, economic viability. Two, <clears throat> positioning the, the community for future growth and advancement in leadership. Um, and, and three, st structure in our uh, just daily operations, best practices probably on how to 
um, effectively do like this one, right? What I, what we're doing here, I'll start. See, that's a pilot, right? At some point, we want to implement it nationally. At some point, so hence we, we, we you know, we're 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 on the ground having these conversations and these interactions, so that when we have that conversation. Um, you can do that with that that a quick that effective what SWOT analysis that was what yeah you can you can you can be able to really bring a critical eye to that. So I would probably say uh, those two are the biggest um, areas of opportunity for us that we're that we're working on the financial feasibility and leadership and advancement um, for the youth. And when I say leadership, I am not talking about Arabic. Tajweed. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about what you what you're doing. Sitting here and have to put a program together that meets the needs of your community, that addresses the needs of the community, and that also, inshallah, can have an impact on the society. Taking what we're reading in the book now and living it out here in a very tangible way. Uh, you mentioned there's regional kind of meetings yes. together and whatnot. Yes. Uh, so are the different communities that are here, whether in Houston, Austin, Dallas, they're operating independently uh, on the national level, you know, from coast to coast. Yes. All the different communities. How do y'all, <clears throat> is there anything central that connects y'all? How do y'all? Yes. Central? Well, yes. And you just, you, you got a good look at that. Uh, was it, was it a couple of Sundays ago? So, 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 so at that point, then that was Texas. So that, so, Within this region, let's start with that. We have a southwest region. And this region is Texas, uh, Louisiana, Arkansas, Oklahoma, New Mexico. And they just had a meeting in uh, Orlando, Florida, November 22nd. No. Is before Thanksgiving, November the 11th, somewhere around there. No, no, October 22nd. There we go. October 22nd. And so at that particular uh, convention, you had all of the regions within the, uh, the nation there. And so you had regional representatives, because it's broken up into four regions the east, the west, the north, the south. So it's four regions. And so these people are called uh, conveners, they're conveners, right, of the regions. And then they had a collective convention there. So that's how that works. And then you have one that's uh, within the states. So I'm just trying to give you a little breakdown. Now, obviously, it's a little bit more sophisticated, right? You know, someday I'll, I'll show you the chart. We got the maps and the and all of the, but but so 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 what what we're doing now is we have to transition, right? Have how do you how do you get people who are ready to now turn that responsibility over to another group. How do you do that? <clears throat> How do you prepare for that? If the, you know, you're ready to pass the baton and there's no idea to pass the baton to back to my original point. I was saying that is getting the group ready and understanding what the responsibility is, where I, where the biggest disconnect that I see globally in all religions is that the, the future group, does not want that responsibility. I'm not going to say they don't take responsibility because that's saying that they don't want to be responsible for anything. That's not true. They don't want to be responsible for that particular thing. Because that's what we'll do. Do you don't want to? Well, well, they well, they do want to be responsible for other things, just not that. So you can't say that it's so that tells me that there's a disconnect in them caring enough to see that they got to take it even if you're the one left. You can't, even if it's, you can't say, well, I don't want it. You got to say, well, I guess it's me then. And that's not our attitude. And that's because we don't understand how important it is. And so to you, that's our job, right? That's why me and my relationship with you is so critical because you will give me an opportunity to look at other things beyond just what I'm looking at. I get a chance to see the world through your eyes. Right. Which God willing, it gives me a chance as my heart gets sensitized. Now my vision gets broader, too. And I could be more effective. I hope I wasn't too long with that. 
I think that speaks to such a prophetic model uh, that 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 the message of Islam didn't come in a vacuum. It, it came dynamically and it grew organically. It faced those challenges and and uh, it met human needs and it, it it met human challenges as well. But I met folks where they were. So appreciate that. Uh, the last question we just got is about um, with respect to uh, Austin Dawa Center yes. um, for folks um, that may not be familiar with Austin Dawa Center yes. or maybe reconnecting with Austin Dawa yes. Center. They're, they're coming back after a scenic route around. Uh, curious about how, how can they get plugged in to the work that y'all do? How can they get involved? Um, yeah, just tell us a little bit about uh, if somebody's interested in learning more about the work of Austin Dawa Center, getting involved, showing up, so on and so forth. How can they go about uh, doing so? Uh, what I'll do is I will give you my email address now. Um, and then, you know, you can you can you can write me and we can get you plugged in. I can tell you about the programs. I can um, tell you that now. But I obviously I want to open myself up for a a more personal approach and, and try to answer your questions specifically and not just give you like this general thing and send you somewhere. You know, we want you to know that you matter. You're important. Uh, you're a light for us, right? So I'll start with that. So if anyone else has a question, I want you to be able to email your questions because maybe you had a question and maybe you wanted to ask it and maybe you're a little shy or, you know, maybe you didn't know how to formulate it or anything like that. So it'll be A, W, I'll write it. This wonderful classroom to get on this board, man. So I see the cameras. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll type in the chat. A W S. We have a uh, we also have an official uh Austin Dawa Center, but I'm gonna I'm going to give you this one first so we can we can connect and then I can connect you with that one because I want you to be able to reach us. Um, and I don't want to leave it for a chance that someone doesn't see it. So it's A-W-S-H-A-R-E-E-F at Gmail. So any questions or any concerns or any, any comments, um, we can start we can start right there and then we can we can begin connecting there. Uh, we have Juma um, here at the uh, Austin Presbyterian Serenary here. Um, Juma's at 130 here, 100 East 27th uh, Street. Uh, I think we're still in 211. Okay, in the McMillan, 211 in the McMillan. Um, we have Thursday classes uh, here as well. Uh, so if you want to come out tomorrow uh, from 7 to 8 o'clock, uh, we have classes here. Um, is that the McCord, 203? Okay, uh, right in this room, the McCord, uh, room 203. Uh, so those are the two that, that we have. We have a monthly Talim series that we have coming. The next one is going to be um, on December the uh, the 17th. But like I said, if you email, you email, but I can kind of send you a calendar. And then I can put you on our email list. That way we can begin to uh, send you information anytime we have an event. And also, uh, I would like to get your ideas on events or things that you would like to see or uh, topics that you have an interest in that you want to see us cover. See, that's how this works. This works when we are giving the information that you're looking for. This religion is so vast, right? And so sometimes we can be good in our intentions, but we're not hitting the mark because we're not addressing the subject that you care about. That's what makes this work. And we want to address the subjects that you care about. So I wanted to uh, ex extend that and thank you all. So like I said, don't be shy to email me. Like I said, you may um, had a question, didn't know how to structure it. So you could email me the question and I'll definitely give, give you a response. Absolutely. Well, Jazakallah uh, Khair, Imam Asim has been great, uh, but definitely leaves us with a lot uh, more to discuss than, than we just scratched the surface uh, that we that we answered. So, uh, but we really appreciate you doing such a deep dive into the community, into the dynamics holistically, yes. uh, the history, the the, the culture, uh, and the traditions. And uh, yeah, we're, we're really looking forward to being able to continue that conversation and Love. to be able to see uh, the work of Austin Dawa Center to support yes. that work and uh, to to be able to connect with it as as you know at the base level as our fundamental duty as Muslims oh, <laughs> to be able to do so. Yes. Um, but Thank you so much. Absolutely. And and for the folks online, inshallah, uh, we've got Imam Asim's uh, email. 
uh, plugged into the chat, but uh, for folks who may be watching this later, uh, it's right right behind the Mount Mossum there, but we'll also send a recap out um, for all folks who had registered so you're able to be, be connected. We'll see, see his email address there as well, so y'all can get in touch. Uh, but with that, uh, we'll, we'll be uh, closing, inshallah, for tonight. Uh, the next Inside Islam we'll be having in December, uh, so stay tuned for that. We'll have some more information. Uh, we're, we're not done with the series. We've got a long way to go, and we have a part two uh, that's due up with uh, Imam Asim. Yes. But uh, Imam, I'd like to give you the final word, uh, inshallah. Anything you'd like to close us out on or anything uh, you'd like to leave with the audience as we close out? Uh, yes. Um, that what connects us is the Lord of everything. And that we all come from different places with different experiences. And those different places and those different experiences is supposed to be a strength for us. Our diversity is supposed to be a strength for us. So may Allah bless us to make the different experiences that we have, the different exposures that we have, the different concerns that we have, may they connect us in being the dynamic community that we saw demonstrated in the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And may it, be, may it be a light for the people in these times to address their critical needs and concerns. Thank you so much. Look forward to seeing and being with you again. May Allah's peace be upon you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.